Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the Tee. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I have the honor of having two of my favorite guests that we've had so far on the show with me, Paul Stankowski and Bob Friend, Jr. You know, there was a time when if you asked me about, you know, who would your dream force and, you know, be to play with, I would have said Jack Nicholas, Gary Player, my father, and myself. But now, give me Paul Stankowski, give me Bob Friend, Jr., and my father, and it's going to be a, you know, a really great day and a fun afternoon. And uh, that would be my dream for some right now. Uh, let me remind you a little bit about both of these great guys that are going to be with me today. Paul, you'll remember, has been uh, playing out on tour since 1991. He won three times between the uh, web.com and the regular tour. He co-hosts his own radio show on the uh, PGA Tour channel on Sirius XM. Plus, he's a big Alabama football fan. So, We'll talk about all of those sort of things when he joins me. He's going to be along in just a few moments. Later on, about 20 minutes from now, Bob Friend Jr. is going to be with me. And Bob, you know, played his college golf at LSU. So it's a good thing these two guys aren't on the show together. But Bob's from my hometown in Pittsburgh. Uh, His father, baseball fans will recall, played for the Pirates and was a part of their 1960 World Series championship team. He started his professional career back in 1990. Uh, currently playing out on the Champions Tour. Plus, he's the director of operations in his spare time at uh, Pikewood National Golf Club, which uh, if you joined us last time Bob was on the show, you'll know is is one of the most beautiful golf courses on the planet. But we'll talk about all those things. Bob, like I say, will be along about 20 minutes from now. But before we get started, we want to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military and everyone listening in on the Armed Forces Sports Radio Network. Thank you for uh, your daily sacrifices and all the things that you do to keep the rest of us safe every day. Thanks to our veterans who have done that in the past for us so bravely as well. We also want to you know, thank those of you that serve or have served in every branch, not only of the military, but of public service. We truly appreciate what you do to preserve our freedoms and our liberties. It's through your strength and efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Stephen Lee, Dennis Farrell, and all the folks at the Armed Forces Sports Radio. It's an honor to be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesportsradionetwork.org. Uh, you can also you know, uh, find us you know, across Internet radio stations everywhere. We want to thank everyone for listening in on iHeartRadio, as well as great sites like Spreaker.com, Stitcher, TuneIn, Player.fm, and Blog Talk Radio. I uh, also want to give a shout-out to our good friends, Mike Novax, Ben Kerr, Mark Modeski, and the uh, rest of the great staff over at LastWordOnSports.com. Check those guys out online and on Twitter. Their site's fantastic. It, can, it contains great content across every sport. Their staff of writers are wonderful. You're going to love going to their site every day for your sports news. If you haven't been there yet, check it out and then bookmark it. It's Last word on sports.com and if uh, someone's dragging you to the mall or the grocery store or you're just tired of the same old same old take us on your commute with us like i say player.fm stitcher.com you can listen to us on your smartphones and uh, all your mobile devices uh, let us give us something uh, to take your mind off where you're at and what you're doing uh, plug us in we'd love to have i'd love to be a part of your commute or your daily events all right, I want to get to our first guest. Uh, back with me on the Kyvan Foods guest line is PGA Tour Pro Paul Stankowski. Let me remind you about Paul's background. He's from Oxnard, California. He started playing uh, golf at the age of eight years old. He attended the University of Texas at El Paso, where he was a three-time All-American and won the Western Athletic Conference Championship in 1990, turned pro in 1991, His uh, first pro victory came on the nationwide tour at the 1996 Nike Louisiana Open, and he backed that up by winning the following week on the regular tour at the Bell South Classic, becoming the only golfer in history to win on the nationwide tour and the PGA Tour in back-to-back weeks. In all, Paul's won seven times, and I'm honored to have him with me next on the tee again. Paul, thanks for coming back and being a part of the show this morning. Chris, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Paul, One of the things that I respect most about you is your strong religious foundation. The first time you played golf was on Easter Sunday when you were eight years old, and you you know your first win came on the regular tour on Easter Sunday at the Bell South Classic in '96. Talk about what the significance that had for you. Wow. Well, the uh, my my start on Easter Sunday. um, My dad played golf every weekend, and um, he was a mailman. He retired from the Air Force. Uh, did 21 years and 
and then joined the Postal Service with the mailman. And so his uh, his Sunday was free. Um, and so he would play golf every Sunday. Well, anyway, on Easter Sunday, this one particular 1978, he, uh, he and my brother were going to play, and we kind of walk around on the next or something. We loaded in our station wagon with the, you know, faux wood paneling down the side. And as we pulled into the uh, the Navy the Navy golf course there in Port Wainimi, um, that's where I grew up learning, he uh, lowered the tailgate and sat down and started putting his shoes on, and he pulled a pair of shoes out and said, here, you might want to put these on. You know, April in California was, uh, you get a lot of dew on the ground in the morning. And so I, uh, I threw some golf shoes on so I wouldn't get my uh, sneakers all wet. And uh, as soon as I got those laced up, he pulled another set of clubs out from somewhere behind a seat, hidden. And uh, it was a set of hand-me-down, you know, I had like a Patty Berg 5-iron, and it was just a mismatched set of clubs. And, and he said, you need these because you're playing today. And, and um, so nice. obviously I was thrilled and went out and and, uh, and played my first round. I shot 75 uh, very, on the front nine. And, um, and then <laughs> shot 70, really? 72. Really? 75 right out of the shoot? <laughs> Yeah, shot 72 on the back, shot 147 that first day, and and uh, made a par, and and it was uh, that was all she wrote, man. I was hooked, and I could not wait to play every every weekend. And um, summer times, I I spent playing golf. But that Easter Sunday was a sweet day, and and uh, I still have a scrapbook that that your dad made for me as a as a junior golfer. And the very first page was a, a picture, the scorecard, and it said that the title on the top of the page says, uh, "What a joyous Easter." And uh, wow. so it was sweet. And, and, you know, we grew up going to church. And um, But beyond uh, being a tender at church, I, I didn't have a, uh, a faith, per se, of my own and, uh, but uh, until college. And, and so when, when uh, I won in Atlanta uh, back in 1996 on Easter Sunday, it, it meant something different. Because uh, uh, at that point I had a, a strong faith in the Lord, and, and Easter uh, meant a lot more to me than just the Easter bunny and Easter eggs. Um, and right. so uh, that was um, an even more so joyous Easter. You uh, you grew up Catholic and were an altar boy, and so did I. I. I know your brother had a major influence for you and your relationship with Christ, but Scott Simpson also played a big role for you. Is that right? He did, yeah. Uh, that was in college, my first, uh, uh, my first NCAA championship. Um, Scott came and spoke at a uh, uh, at North Ranch and and shared his uh, his story. Uh, it was through a ministry called College Golf Fellowship, and uh, they used to bring in tour players and uh, and they would they would share their story uh, of faith. and And uh, I didn't like Scott at the time. I never met him, but I didn't like him because he beat Tom Watson in the U.S. Open at Olympic Club that year uh, <laughs> prior to that. And and so I wasn't very uh, thrilled to be hearing this guy's story because all I could think about was my my childhood hero getting beat by this guy. And um, yeah. but what he said intrigued me. He talked about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I I never heard those words before, and I didn't really know what that looked like. But I, I definitely it struck a chord in me, um, and I was intrigued. And I remember checking off a box on a on a note card that that CGF College Golf Fellowship had left on the table saying, I, I want to know more about this relationship with Christ. And uh, they ended up sending me a Bible, and, and over the next four years um, kind of walked me through um, what the Christian life is, what it looks like, you know, what, who Jesus was. You know, I knew who he was. He was the Son of God. I knew he died on the cross. I, I, but I didn't – it never – I never got it uh, that um, – he is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and this is what the Bible says, and I believe it. So anyway, it, uh, Scott, it's now, I, I, I love the guy. He's a, he's a dear friend. Uh, I don't get to see him very often anymore because he's up on the Champions Tour, but uh, but when I do see him, I just smile, and he smiles back, and, and he knows my story. He knows he's a big part of my story, and uh, and it's really cool. So it's been fun watching him over the years with young people and, and college golfers and uh, now I sit on the board of that same ministry, College Golf Fellowship, and, and uh, I've been hosting uh, retreats uh, in the summer and the winter since 1997 in my house uh, with these college kids that, that would come in and for three days, and they'd sleep anywhere there's carpet on my floor. And, and uh, <laughs> from 97 to 04, it was just me doing it uh, through, through, the, uh, through the ministry. And then in 94, Ben Crane and Lee Jansen got involved, and 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 now now I'm I'm uh, well. This is the first year I've, I've not hosted since 1997, 
and uh, their guy, Stuart Sink, just got his first retreat, and Jack Johnson, uh, Jay Bird, Davis Love, uh, Webb Simpson, uh, Scott Stallings. There's so many guys involved now. Um, it's really cool, and, and so there's Justin Leonard's doing one now in Dallas, and um, so all over the country in the summertime, in the winter, uh, with the holiday break, um, there are between 25 and 100 guys will come to a tour by yourself and, and uh, be taught some gospel. Um, uh, uh, We're losing your cell a little bit, Paul. Uh, uh, you're, you're sort of digitizing out on us. How about now? There you, you go. Me now? I All got right. you now. I'm sitting in a Target parking lot because my we we, uh, <laughs> we sold our house. We sold our house three week two weeks ago, and so we're in transition. So we're we're waiting to buy a house, and so I'm in an apartment. I didn't want to talk in the middle of the living room because it's like ten steps. Anybody up? So I'm I'm out in the parking lot. <laughs> uh, so I apologize, but uh, no worries. Anyway, it's been a it's a neat ministry, and and. Uh, Scott, uh, yeah, Scott was uh, a very in, uh, influential part of my in my life and my spiritual journey. So, for people that want more information about what you're doing, how can they find out? Whether go online or you know, over social media, how can they get involved? You know, College Golf Fellowship. Golly, I wish I had their their. It's you could Google College Golf Fellowship. Um, okay. And we have a website. I, I it should be collegegolffellowship.com, maybe. Um, okay. <laughs> probably makes sense to, to be that. Um, and uh, they're on Twitter. There's a bunch of different Twitter handles. There's 16 staff guys around the country, uh, each of them strategically placed, and, and uh, they do a lot of one-on-one discipleship with, with teams and individual players, um, and uh, it's really cool. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. College Golf Fellowship, if they want to know more about that, um, right. it's neat. They'll, they'll have pictures and video. They do a rafting trip. They did a fishing trip. They we just it's it's more just doing life with these guys, you know, and, and it's not necessarily all about golf, uh, but it is all about the Lord and and, and uh it's really cool. Yeah, that's great stuff. And it is collegegolffellowship.com. dot com. There you go. Paul, I was I was I was going through some videos of you on YouTube and back in twenty eleven during the first round of the Houston Open, you jarred a shot from eighty seven yards out on the par five fifteenth hole for Eagle and after it went in you, you you just sort of cleaned up your divot, moved on like, you know, what, that? Nah, it's no big deal. If it's me, I'm high fiving the caddy, I'm I might throw in a Chi Chi Rodriguez saber dance. You know, my, my father, if it was him, he'd look at me and go, Ah, golf's an easy game. But you, nothing. Why? Uh, you know what? I wish I'd celebrated a little bit because I think that was my last good shot I ever hit. <laughs> so it, it, it would have been nice to at least a little fist pump. You know, you, 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 I've always tried to be very even keel. You know, I, I've early on in my career, I had a, I had a really bad temper, and so I, I tended to wear my emotions on my sleeve. Usually, when it went poorly, when things went well, I wasn't a fist pumper like Tiger. Um, I wasn't that guy that, that wanted to uh, get super excited, but I did get super mad. And, and after my injuries, I, you know, I dealt with them from 03 through 07. And when I came back um, from my injuries, I, you know, I, I was determined to, to let the bad stuff just kind of roll off. Um, uh, I, I, I've never been really good at coming back from a mental blow up. Um, you know, when I blow a gasket, it typically the car is shot and, some guys can get mad and come right back at fuel them. I would get mad and it would derail me. Um, so I realized quickly that, okay, this is not, well, not quickly, over time, that this is not <laughs> the way I want to handle myself. Plus, when I, when I started doing some uh, Series XM back in the day in, in 05, when I, I missed the whole season due to a, a, a finger injury, um, I started watching guys. You know, I got a little up close and personal there and, and get to see the players from a different perspective. And, and I did not uh, – I did not like what I saw from an attitude standpoint. And what I saw was me, you know, I'm like, that's me. That's what I'm doing. And it, and I didn't want to look like a moron out there. You know, I know there's kids <laughs> watching all the time. There's, there's people watching, but a lot of kids and, and, you know, the whole role model wanting to be an influence on, on people, um, especially kids. I, I thought this is not good. I'm not being a, a good example. Um, and so I try to I tried to be even keel and and you know I have a son now so it, it 
I think he was there in Houston. But, I, you know, I, it's okay to show excitement when you play. It really is. I just haven't learned how to do it. Uh, I'm a background guy. I don't like to be in the forefront of anything. I, I'd rather, I sit in the last row of church. I, I don't like to be in the middle of anything, which is kind of strange as a golfer because when you're on a tee yeah. box, you're in the middle of everything. But that's just that's part of the job. But in in real life, I, I'm, I'm a fringe guy. I don't you know I'm not a guy that wants to control the the uh, the conversation. You know, I love to sit back on the couch when there's a bunch of people watching a game and just watch a game. Or I, if we're having a conversation, I, li- I do a lot of listening. And and uh, so you know I'm not that guy that wants to be you know fist pumping. And I, I've tried to do it, and I feel so awkward, especially like on a you know when you make a 40 foot putt. That's a long way to walk. And so once you fist pump, and then all of a sudden the, you're not to the hole yet, and the crowd's died down, it's awkward. So I just like to just casually get up there and, and, uh, and do my thing. But some guys, you know, man, they love fist pumping. And I think it's fun to watch a guy that – it's more fun to watch Tiger fist pump than me, you know, just kicking a divot back in gently and putting the hand in the club to my caddy and throwing up to the green. It's boring, right? You like that's just a crowd going. So, you know, I probably should have shown more emotion, but – um, oh well. It's it's interesting though that you say that, right? Because I also saw in, an interview where you said you like playing with guys who have bad attitudes, actually, guys who throw clubs, big personality guys, and you're the exact opposite of that. Why why do you like playing with those guys? You know, it's it's like watching reality TV, man. It just it it sucks you in. You know, you drive by a wreck <laughs> on the freeway and you always look at the wreck. So. When guys are having a train wreck on the golf course, it's kind of entertaining, especially when they blow gaskets. Because I'm like, that to me, I'm, I want to be entertained. I go to a lot of movies. I don't read a lot of books. Okay, I don't have the time. Yeah. I don't have the patience to sit there and read a book. I'd rather wait for the movie to come out and watch it, whether it's better right. than the book or not. Usually, it's not apparently. Uh, but I, I'm yeah, I'm a big fan of watching guys just you know lose it. It's kind of, it's it's humorous, you know, and and. Uh, <laughs> You know, so and there's there's some guys who have some crazy tempers, and a lot of times it's not humorous. A lot of times it's just it's it's just really disheartening um, when it's in the wrong situation. You know, there's old ladies by the tee box or kids, and and there's f bombs going, and, and right. people can be really, you know, people everybody can be a jerk at one point or another. And I've I've had my share of of f bombs and um, rude behavior, and and uh, and I'm I'm you know. I, to, to say I, I wish I had that back, I don't think I do uh, because it's a part of my story, you know, and that's that's right. a part of the, the, the gospel that, that drew me in was grace. And and in this day and age, there's a lot of stuff going on with Ray Rice. Now we've got AP with his right. stuff. And, and it is so it is disheartening. It's it's sad to think that these guys, um, one, did what they what they did, and two, are going through what they're going through, and, and the victims and, and all that stuff, and it's it's sad, you know, but the fact is we are human beings, and there's not one of us that are criticizing these guys uh, that are that are innocent of, of maybe right. we haven't punched our spouse or whipped our kids to the point that it drew blood, um, you know what I mean, but we've all done really stupid things, spontaneous things, things that we wish we could take back. Um, but fortunately for us, they weren't on video. Um, and you know, that's, that's a, uh, I mean, it's just hard. It's hard to condemn when we should be condemned. Uh, you know, and that, that's a, <clears throat> that's just a struggle of mine. Um, now I understand that there's, there's laws and, and we've got to, we can't break the law, but anyway, it's just in this day and age with, with social media and, and the, uh, the accessibility uh, man, you can't do anything wrong. You can't say the wrong thing because people are waiting for you to say something borderline uh, non-politically correct just so they can slam you and jump. I mean, that's their full-time career is to wait for someone to be uh, to speak their mind in a way that may or may not be right, and they'll twist it or they'll just focus on the part on the part you did wrong. And and that sucks. It really does suck to be in, to <laughs> be living in that day and age because. You can't be real, and you don't know who you can be real with. And you know what? Sometimes uh, saying a factual thing, I think Danny, was it Danny Ferry, the Atlanta, is he the new Atlanta GM? Yep. I may have the wrong, yep. wrong guy, but he, he, was no, re- right. replaying, he was replaying what somebody else had said um, about something in the organization, and, um, and they criticized him, and Magic Johnson wants his head. And I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, he didn't even, it wasn't his own words. He was in many ways, words, he said it, but he was repeating what someone else had said in talking about how we do things right here, whatever. And, and right. it's like, 
you can't say anything, you know, because you can, all it is is a video clip, audio clip, and they could just clip it and then go, look at what he said. And you're like, well, I said that. Um, so it, it's a, man, oh, man, it's tough. Being on radio, uh, every day I walk in the studio, I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> don't, don't say anything stupid. I, half the time, I'm, I'm like, I don't even want to talk. Just because there are those people that that's all they want to do, right, Chris? I mean, they're they're looking at how are we going to make a story here? Oh my goodness, he said that. Oh, he's he's a racist or he's a right. sexist or it's like oh my goodness. Um, well, so anyway, what a different. That's world. the difference now, is is it not, Paul? And maybe that's the difference, you know, because athletes have to be different now. And you know, to your point, you're you're still in the in, in the middle of it, but. Everybody's the media now, right? I mean, we got yeah, we got yeah. Bob Friend Jr. going to join us in 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 a, in a couple of moments, and you know his father played you know professional baseball back in the early '60s, and things things didn't get out as much as they do now. But everybody's the media now because we all have walking cameras, right? Where we can videotape everything, and you know there are cameras that you know you're you're in a Target parking lot. There's a camera on you if they really wanted to see you. So <laughs> exactly. you've got to be conscious constantly. And on guard because somebody's got a cell phone, somebody's got a camera, somebody's got an open recorder. And you're right, you know, to, you know, to quote, to quote uh, Don Henley, it, we love dirty laundry. Right? So we, yeah. we're, we're looking for it, we're waiting for it. Give it to us. All right, now I'm a yeah. hero because I caught you saying something. It may not be what you intended, but I got you. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've got to be careful, be on guard. And that's the thing, I and mean, that's biblical, be on guard. They're, uh, the devil's waiting to prowl. He's prowling around. So, you know, I'm not saying the media is the devil because it's not. But, but there, like I say, there are people with intentions only to harm. Um, right. I mean, good night. With, from ISIS, you name it. I mean, this is a crazy, crazy world we're living in. And, and I'm in a bubble here in Flower Mound, Texas, where it's, you know, it's suburbia. Um, it's, we call it the bubble because it's not real life. You know, real life is in the streets. Real life is, is downtown. Um, you know, it, it's a... It's a different deal. This is this is the bubble. Um, anywhere, any suburban, you know, nicer area is not real. Um, I remember Mickelson made a comment one one year, it's been years ago, so I'm sure his views have changed. But they asked him what he'd be doing if he wasn't playing golf, and he said, um, I may misquote him, but he said something to the effect of, "Well, I'd like to I'd like to think I'd be in public office." And they said, "Why would you think that?" And, and uh, the story is, he said because I feel I have a better grasp on reality than most people. And, um, and I, I was like, wow, that, that's so wrong because we don't have a great <laughs> reality. On, on, we don't have a grasp on reality because we're athletes, and athletes get everything for free. And, and they're, we live with a – I mean, it's just a different deal, right? Uh, but maybe right. he did have a better grasp. But and maybe, maybe I've misquoted him. I'm just quoting – I could be like Tim Taylor, you know, from <laughs> standing on the fence talking to – the neighbor and I butchered it. But <laughs> bottom line is, as an athlete, we don't have uh, our reality is so different because we're given so much. Uh, we play a game, you know, whether in golf we hit a ball, baseball you, you hit a ball, football you you catch a ball, or you just block somebody, and they pay you millions and millions of dollars to do something so trivial as that. Um, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. But you know, I'm grateful for <laughs> what it allowed and in uh you know in our life but it's it's still a, a crazy deal you know the, the those guys over uh fighting for our country um that's 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 awesome what we do as 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 athletes i mean it, maybe we do it better than other people but really it's it's still just hitting a ball um which is really it's really silly to think about it but um someone's got to do it right <laughs> <laughs> right i uh, a couple more before we let you go. We've got Bob Friend on the line. We want to get to Bob in, in, in just a second. But just a couple more before we let you go, Paul. One, Hi, in, Bob. A, in a um, sure in a 1997. Sure what's that? Make sure you tell him I said hi. I haven't talked to Bob in Absolutely. a while. Absolutely. I'm sure he can hear you. Um, in a 1997 article on SI, you said uh, you were going to win the Masters one day. Is that dream still alive for you? That is one of the dreams that uh, I never did get to, to realize. And, and, you know, as a kid growing up, I, I, I dreamt. I dreamt of playing the tour. I dreamt of winning on tour. I dreamt of playing in the Masters. I dreamt of winning the Masters. Um, that was it, those four things. You know, I, I didn't dream of winning the U.S. Open. I think I, I, I won it 100 times as a kid, but it wasn't a, a dream of mine uh, like winning at Augusta. And, you know, obviously dreams are dreams. When I was 15 years old, um, I never 
even though I dreamt of doing all those things, I never dreamt that I would have gotten to do what I've gotten to do. Um, and I'm, and I'm so thankful for it, but, uh, yeah, I, I never did. And, and, you know, I'm not saying I, I never will, but, uh, I need to start practicing, uh, if I could even beat the guys that I play with here at home. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't practice anymore. So unless, uh, yeah, I mean, miracles do happen, right? I mean, it happened in yeah. 1980, didn't it? Um, so yeah. it's, uh, you never know, but I, yeah, that, that's, that's one that, that I didn't get to achieve, but, uh, but I, you know, I did get to play and, and uh, I had a chance, you know, it was fun, even though we, we you know, I, I lost by 16 shots in 97, it felt like I had a chance to win, and, and uh, um, that, was a, that was a lot of fun, uh, getting to experience Tiger's uh, right. record-breaking uh, golf uh, from the group in front of him. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, it would have been cool, but, you know, what? I'm, I'm grateful for the, the career I did have. Uh, it wasn't great, it was long, I had a couple good weeks in there, and, and a lot of very mediocre golf, but... Uh, I'm grateful for the good ones. It, it allowed me to, to do some, some cool things and, you know, to get insurance and, you know, some things that, that right now as a, as a washed up 44 year old, um, it, you know, <laughs> I get, I have really good insurance and, and, um, I get some, you know, carry town car, uh, perks and, you know, there's some still some things I get to carry over from those wins. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, there you go. All right. So I'd, I'd be remiss. We, you know, Bob played his college golf at LSU you're a big Alabama fan, so talk to me about you know who wins the SEC West, and uh, are your boys going to be uh, in the in the uh, top four for the playoff this season? You know it's going to be tough. They're you know obviously with juggling quarterbacks, um, that's a uh, that's never easy, right? I mean, you're like golly, right. they, they both look they both look solid and capable. Um, you know, it seems like with that offense, they just need somebody to manage the game well, um, and uh, you know, Saban's a great coach, and, and I, what I love about Nick Saban, and, and people, you know, they call him Nick Satan or whatever. You either love right. him or hate the guy, but as a coach, he's a great coach. I think everybody could admit, um, and I'm sure Bob would say, yeah, looking from the outside, he's a good coach, um, and he gets his players, he gets them to buy into the fact that if each one of those guys do their job, they're going to win the game. And so my job, if you're an inside linebacker, your job is to do your job, not to worry, complain, to – to celebrate, it's to do your job. And if each of those guys does their job, they're going to win. And, he, and they buy into it. And you don't see that team making dumb penalties, doing dumb things. They, they're, they execute football. And, and, and I love that. And it, as, a, as a dad with, with kids, that's what I try to instill in them, do their job. Josh, the only two things he can he could rely on is his training and his attitude. And if, if he can train well and have a good attitude, the only two things he can control – Right, uh, is are those yep. two things? So um, I, I love what Nick's done in Alabama. Obviously, I, I grew up liking Alabama. I think because they were always on. And Bear Bryant, and I was a Cowboy fan as well. And Landry, they both had fedoras. I guess it was something about the hat, maybe. But um, <laughs> you know, about six years ago, I got back on the bandwagon, and it's been a lot of fun. I, I just I love watching disciplined teams, um, and they're they're one of the best. There you go. All right, Paul. So, how can our listeners follow you either online, check out your, you know, the, the radio show, or, or over social media? Yeah, the radio show is called The Game, um, and I'm on Monday and Wednesday. The, the show is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, from uh, three to five Eastern, and it's on PJTour.com. Uh, we're not on SiriusXM, but we're on PJTour.com, so we stream live um, three to five. I'm on um, Monday and Wednesday. Uh, with Tim Matthews and Steve Johnson. Um, my Twitter is at Paul Stankowski, and uh, my company is Francis Edward, and that, that's uh, at Francis Edward underscore, uh, or I guess it's Francis Edward USA on Facebook. But, uh, um, yeah, that's it. Or you can call my cell phone at no, – I won't give you my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, your company, you know, you guys sell amazing exotic leather goods. You know, the uh, the stuff that I've seen online is is fantastic. I wish you'd sold it online as opposed to at, at uh, you know PGA you know um, um, golf courses across the country because that yeah. the stuff you guys have is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. We, we you know I I really want to as a PGA member. Uh, I understand the importance of the PGA of America and these club pros, and and uh, so I really want right. to go through golf tops. And uh, we we will sell if somebody doesn't live in an area where there's a golf course that, that we have our products. 
um, and they call in. You know, we'll sell them over the phone, but we're not. It's not. We're not selling to the masses online. Um, but uh, but really going through high end. Uh, really not even high end golf shops. Just golf shops. Our products are. You know, from we do some Italian calf skin as our as our entry level all the way up to alligator and and um, but the, the custom aspect of what we do uh, makes pro shops happy because they're not having to buy a ton of inventory and a majority of our sales in pro shops are are through custom orders so the club isn't having to pre order they they or prepay um, those are those are right. things that their members are, are ordering and we deliver them in you know three to four weeks and uh, it's all custom handmade here in, in the United States of America so everything's USA. Uh, I love it. I love it about what we're doing, um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Good for you, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. You're a fantastic guest. I hope you'll continue to come back and join me from time to time because it's always a blast uh, talking to you. Well, anytime, Chris. You're like I say, you're one of the best uh, um, interviewers, hosts of the show. You, you know your stuff. You pick up stuff. I'm like, where'd you get that information? So uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. I really do. And, and uh, anytime, just give me a shout. Love to come on. All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the best to your dad as well for a speedy recovery from his knee surgery, and all the best to, to you and your family. Hopefully we get to do this again real soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Paul. Paul Stankowski, what a great guy. Definitely in the dream foursome. What a fun time that would have. And so much in common with him. I I just love talking to Paul. He makes it he makes it so much fun. All right, we're going to get to our next guest, uh, Bob Friend Jr., on the other side of uh, this quick station identification. This is Joe Longinusa from Thursday Night Tailgate, and you're listening to On the Tee with Chris Mascaro on the Armed Forces Radio Network. All right, now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is another one of our favorite guests on this show, Bob Friend Jr. Let me uh, remind you about Bob's background. He's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so you know right off the top he's a great guy. He played on the Nationwide Tour, the PGA Tour, now Champions Tour, since 1990. Had five top ten finishes his rookie year. Got his first win at the 1991 Fort Wayne Open. He had five top ten finishes again in 1994 and three more in 97. If you're a baseball fan, you'll remember his father, who played in the major leagues from 1951 to 1966, mostly with the Pittsburgh Pirates and was a a key member of their 1960 world championship team that beat the Yankees. Bob can now be heard broadcasting on the Back Nine Network on Sirius XM, as well as co-hosting a local radio show that can be heard all over West Virginia called Tee to Green. Plus, he's the director of operations at Pikewood National Golf Club in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is one of the most beautiful golf courses on the planet. And it is a privilege to have him back with me on Next on the Tee. Good morning, Bob. How you doing, Chris? I'm fantastic. You? I'm great. I didn't know I had all those darn top ten finishes <laughs> on the nationwide. <laughs> like as, as, Paul, as my buddy Paul said, you, 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 you seem to pull all this stuff out and you throw it out there, and it's all accurate, I guess. I... Uh, I know that I played, had some very good years on the Nationwide Tour, had a few good years on the PGA Tour, but uh, darn, that was uh, that was impressive. I like that. Yeah. Look look how impressive you are, and you didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. Gosh darn it. My mom <laughs> always told me I was, but I didn't believe her until now. Speaking of it, before we get started, how are your folks doing? They're hilarious. They, uh, I actually, uh, my dad's 83, and he's got right. all new pitching parts. He's got a new right shoulder, new left knee, new right hip. And uh, my mom is 79, nice. and they've been married for 57 years. Wow! And I was I actually went up uh, I actually went up to my parents' house last night and watched the pirate game with my dad. My dad is uh, he's great. I mean, he's in fantastic condition for an 83 year old guy, sharp as all get out. Never misses a pirate game. Uh, he's been retired. He was in the insurance brokerage business for about 26 years. Retired in 2001 and did very well. And uh, they live comfortably here in the Fox Chapel area of Pittsburgh, and he, he's a member, been a longtime member at Oakmont Country Club. He plays two or three days a week, and nice. um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm very blessed, you know, to be able to, to have your parents. I'm 50 years old to have your parents uh, that are still with you and still lucid, and you can do things with them and play golf with them. Um, I'm real blessed. Yeah, no, I, I loved your tweet last night about watching the Pirates game with your dad. Are, are you guys into the heat of this pennant rate? You got the Pirates two and a half games. Back of the Cardinals in the National League Central, a game and a half up for the second wild card spot. I got, I got to imagine your dad is uh, all over that. Oh, very much so. You know, Pittsburgh is. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh has supported this team 
through all the lean years. And, you know, everybody knows the very, very well, right. you know, the last time the Pirates were in the playoffs was 1992 up until last year. Uh-huh. And so it's been a very, very long, hard slog here for, you know, over 20 years. And But the, the Pirate fans, you know, they went, we built this brand new ballpark, PNC Park, and it's, it's, right. it's arguably the best park in baseball. And so they've done a very good job in terms of promoting the team and promoting the product. Uh, but the product hasn't been very good and up until the last couple of years. And we brought Clint Hurdle in here as the manager. And then, obviously, right. um, you know, the guy probably might, might arguably the best player in baseball, Andrew McCutcheon. And then you've got Josh Harrison, who's just having an absolute breakout. You will likely be the Pirates MVP this year. Um, yeah. But McCutcheon is, McCutcheon is tremendous. I mean, he really is the core of this team. They've got a good young pitching staff. And, um, you know, they're making a nice push here at the end. Obviously, look, the Cardinals are going to be very tough to beat. Uh, but right now, as you said, the Pirates having a game-and-a-half lead uh, over top of uh, the Braves and, and the Brewers. And for the wild card, and they're tied with San Francisco. Not tied with San Francisco, but they sit atop the wild card. So the town right. is energized. Um, you know, the, the, the game, ball games are selling out during the week, which is something that they never did. In the right. last several years with Andrew McCutcheon being on board, they've been able to sell that stadium out basically on just almost every single home game. And then coming down the stretch here, last couple of weeks of the season, it's, it's going to be very, very exciting. Yeah, indeed. Um, Bob, you, you, you played in the Dick Sporting Goods Open a few weeks ago on the champions, on the champions Tour up in Endicott, New York, in an event won by Bernard Langer. He's won five what times event, what event, on the hey, Chris, what, event, what event wasn't won, hasn't been won by Bernard Langer? It would be easier. <laughs> the list would be shorter yeah. list of events that he hasn't won. Right, that's that's my point. The guy, the guy, he's won five times on the Champions Tour this year. Finished in the top three, eleven of his eighteen starts. Are you guys encouraging him to go play on the regular tour to a get him out of the way? But also, wouldn't it be kind of cool to see a guy who's just recently turned fifty-seven, you know, potentially win a regular tour event? Well, you know, the, here's what Bernhard's all about. Um, you know, the joke is that he's all about German engineering, um, but the fact <laughs> of the matter is, is that. It, the fact of the matter is that Bernhard Langer's body, um, he, you know, when I first got on tour in 1992, you know, I'd sit there and you go through a season, you get to know the physical therapist really well, and you exercise and whatnot. And you start asking, you know, who's got the best body, who's got the worst body? Well, you know, who had the best body at that time, this is pre-Tiger Woods, was, was Larry Mize, Chip Bernhard Langer. You know, they all, all three of those guys were very flexible, very strong, washboard stomachs. Langer looks today like he did 22 years ago. He has about 5% body fat. He's very strong, he's very flexible, wow. takes great care of himself, and he works extraordinarily hard. Um, this is a guy that, that's, that's constantly trying to get better. What can I do to get better? Um, I don't think he could win on the PGA Tour just because there, I, t- I take that back. A course like a harbor town uh, that doesn't require a lot of length off the tee, um, you know, he would have an opportunity there. But the fact of the matter is, is that this guy, I, I actually thought he was going to be a, a captain's pick for the, for the Ryder Cup team. Uh, is that right? You go and you pick. No, absolutely. You know, here's a guy with all the experience in the world, ferocious competitor. Um, you know, champions tour were playing golf courses that, you know, are anywhere from 7,100 to, you know, 6,800 yards long. Glenn Eagles is 7,200 yards long. He could more than handle it. Um, but here's a guy, you know, and, and you sit there and you, you talk to the other guys on the champions tour. And I've played in four events this year. And you, you talk to the guys, and they're like, well, what's he doing? And I, I sat down uh, at the Dicks having lunch with Jeff Sluman, and he, I just went, Slu, what's going on here? He said, I've never seen anybody make more putts between 10 and 25 feet in my life. He said, I have never seen anything like it. He said, look, we all make, you know, the five-foot putts, the key five-foot putts. We're all great at that. He said, I've never seen anybody make more putts in the 25 to 10 to 15 foot range than this guy. He said, right. he's just filling it up. And he's, he's killing everybody. He, uh, another Pittsburgh native, Arnold Palmer, just celebrated you know, his 85th birthday. You actually got to play with Mr. Palmer at an event, at his event at Bay Hill back yeah. in, in 1999. What, what an incredible honor that had to be. What was that experience like for you? Well, I tell you, um, I'm, I'm, again, I, I, I never say I'm lucky. I'm blessed. I'm, I'm a Christian, and, and the Lord has shined his light down upon me to give me my wonderful parents, my beautiful kids, my health, and everything else. So I don't, I don't really believe in luck. I believe in blessings. And uh, my father knew Arnold Palmer, uh, you know, in the 60s. I mean, they both played professional sports, professional athletes in the same town during the same era. 
Um, right. So I've known Arnold since I was about 14 years old. I remember when he came in, he flew a helicopter in prior to the 1978 PGA at Oakmont. I was 14 years old. He flew in like three weeks before, landed it in the rough just off the edge of the ninth fairway. And, um, you know, I went out there, and I, I, I was like a kid, and everybody's waiting back. And I just said, oh, I just walked out there, and I said, hey, Mr. Palmer and Bobby Friend. He said, hey, Bobby, how you doing? How's your dad? You know, so – I've known him for a long time. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. I played a practice round in the 1994 U.S. Open at Oakmont. I played my practice round with him on Monday. Uh, that was the first time we've ever really played together. And then 99 at Bay Hill, uh, I played my practice round with uh, Paul Hazinger in the morning. And we both that time we were both working with John Redman. And, you know, we got done playing. And we go in and looking at the tee sheet. And Zinger and I are there. We're having lunch. And the sheets are on the table. He's like, holy cow. He says, you're playing with Palmer and Ballesteros. I'm like, I look wow. and I'm like, oh, man. So I had, you know, I got to play with Arnold and Seve on that Thursday and Friday of Bay Hill. And Seve, God rest his soul, uh, you could not have met a better gentleman than, than Seve. He was just a wonderful guy. Obviously, at that time, his struggles with his game were well documented. Um, but right. it was just, you sit there and you just watch Arnold Palmer. And the, the interesting thing that I pulled from it, a couple of things. Number one, the guy never met a stranger. Um, he would get done playing. And smiled at everybody, waved everybody, shook hands, this, that, and the other. He would get done playing. And the only rule when he was done and time to sign autographs was that you put your pen away. Because he's ruined so many shirts with people sticking pens out. So he had his own pen. And he literally <laughs> took the time to sign. I know. It was amazing. Okay, you know, the, the security's there. So people put your pens away. Mr. Palmer has his own pen. He took the time. He signed every single autograph as he's walking along. And, wow. you know, the other thing is that he's just, he's just, a, he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, he, he's truly grateful for what the game of golf has given him. And the other thing that I learned was that Arnold Palmer never aims away from a flagstick, no matter what club he has, no matter what the shot is. And I, I actually asked him that because we're sitting there. A great example, we're on the 18th hole, Bay Hill, Friday. You know, we played late in Thursday, early Friday. And so we're playing – on Friday, the pin on Bay Hill is kind of, you know, everybody who's watched the tournament, there's, it's kind of a, an elbow-shaped uh, green at number 18 at Bay Hill. And so I've driven the ball 25, 35 yards past Arnold all day. And he's back there with a forward, and the pin is cut to the right of the elbow to over the water. And he takes his forward, and he hits it right at it. And he flights it, he hits a draw, ball comes in kind of low, carries on the green, goes back in the back rough. And I'm there with my caddy. I've got a five on. I'm like, okay, let's aim at these bunkers on the left and try to cut it. And at, at the end of the round, we go in there, and, and Mr. Palmer, it was funny because I never, when I was on tour, um, I, didn't, I didn't drink. I didn't have any beer or anything like that. But when Arnold Palmer, when we get done, he said, okay, friendly, it's time for us to go in. Let's have a rolling rock. You know, the, the king asks you to have a beer. You have a beer with the king. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like 1 o'clock. I'm going to have a beer with Arnold Palmer. So we're there, and I'm, I'm talking to him. I said, Oh, I said, I, you, you never aim away from a flag stick. He says, I can't. He said, it's, you know, he says, just not in my makeup. And he said, I've won a lot of golf tournaments hitting it right at the flag. And he said, but I've lost a lot of majors doing it. He said, had I, you know, probably played more smart, conservative, right. uh, such as Jack, he said, instead of having seven majors, I probably would have won 13 majors. And he said, but you know what? He said, that's how I was raised. He said, I, I never found a flag that I couldn't take dead aim at and hit it right at it. So that's just how the guy played. But it was, uh, right. you know, it's one of those things that's, you know, you, we all go through life as professional athletes, and there, there are seminal moments in your life. And that certainly was one. I mean, to have the opportunity, not just to go out and, and go to La Trobe or go to Laurel Valley or go to Oakmont and play a round of golf with him, but to actually sit there in a PGA Tour event, compete with him at his golf course was uh, was Right. Remarkable. Yeah, no doubt. Another Bob, another Pittsburgh guy enjoying a great season on tour is Jim Furyk. It, it feels to me that you know Jim doesn't get enough credit, particularly this season, for what he's done. He, ha- he hasn't won, but he's been right there several times and has three second place finishes. And he's only four shots back at the at the Tour Championship, so he could conceivably still win the FedEx Cup. What are your thoughts on Jim? Well, you know, the funny thing is on Twitter, you know, you sit there and as a, as an athlete, uh, you never like to hear anybody labeled a choker because the people that are doing the labeling have never have never been in the cauldron of the fight. They've never been in the cauldron. And you sit there, and there's so many things going through your mind and so many things that have to go your way to win on the PGA Tour, let alone a dozen times in a U.S. Open such as Jim Furyk has. So you sit there on the, in the Twitterverse, he says, oh, you know, he choked again, choked again. I'm like, choked. I'm like, this guy is one of the most prolific cut makers 
players of the last 25 years. And I said, right. this is a guy who is, who is beyond his prime. He's past his prime. And he's playing against guys that are hitting the ball 30 and 40 yards past him. And this guy is competing with the opportunity to win golf tournaments. Um, he, his, skills has, his, his skills have diminished very, very slightly. Um, he doesn't putt the way that he used to putt back in, you know, in, the, in the late 90s and early part of this decade. But this is a guy that uh, he is a ferocious competitor. The thing, that, the thing that I always was a, admired about Jim Furyk is that you get out there and everybody, you know, you go up and down the range, you've got all these beautiful golf swings. And everybody is trying to get better. You know, you're constantly making tweaks, maybe not the total makeover such as the Tiger Woods, but you're always trying to get better. Here Jim Furyk shows up with a golf swing that frankly looks like a drunken helicopter falling out of a tree. He's got moving <laughs> parts all over the place. And here's a guy that has enough belief and confidence in himself that he never changed it. Now, he would, he would refine what he had. His golf swing isn't exactly the same as it was when he first came out on tour back in 93, 94. But the fact of the matter is that golf swing is very distinctive, and he never made wholesale changes to his golf swing. He had enough courage and enough confidence in himself to stick with what got him there. And look at the career right. the guys had. What's he made? Fifty, sixty million dollars on the PGA Tour. Again, a dozen right. times U.S. Open champion, Ryder Cup member, Presidents Cup member. Again, one of the one of the biggest names in golf the last twenty years. And this guy never made changes to that golf swing, even though he's looking up and down the row here, like, oh, look at that swing, look at that swing, look at that swing, look at that swing. Had enough confidence and courage to believe in what he did, and it, it served him very well over the years. Absolutely right. Bob, you mentioned to me yesterday that uh, you're actually headed over to Oakmont today. You know, Eric Johnson, the, the the director of instruction there at Oakmont, an absolutely great guy who joined me a few weeks ago and is actually going to be back on the show uh, with me on the 27th. I know you guys are friends, so I'm curious, what, what's your favorite Eric Johnson story? Well, it's really not, there's really no Eric Johnson stories that I have in terms of, like, digging up the dirt on Eric. But what I can tell you is this. Um, this guy really knows what he's doing. Um, he's a, you know, look, I'm a, I teach. I also play. I played a pretty good, at a fairly high level, and I know quite a bit about the golf swing. I worked with Jim Suddy. Oh, I still, I guess you could say I still work with Dr. Suddy, but I haven't worked with Jim Suddy for 15 years. Um, you know, I work with all three of my kids. My oldest is now at University of Pittsburgh in the, the Cat School of Business as a freshman. My daughter is a right. junior in high school, and my son Andrew is a freshman in high school, and they all play. My younger two are playing on the golf team at Fox Chapel High School, and my oldest played on the golf team. I work with all three of my kids. The only guy that I would trust with my kids to have them take a look and take a lesson is Eric Johnson. He's very, very knowledgeable, keeps it very, very simple. Uh, We've got great video equipment, great camera equipment there at Oakmont, and um, he's just a wonderful guy. And my mom mom actually has been with Howard Hanna Real Estate for about 40 years. She actually sold him his house. So he's, nice. just, he's just one of those guys. He's got a, he has a great mannerism, has great has a great manner to him. Um, a very knowledgeable teacher, a very good player himself, and you know he's just he's a he's a real professional. And uh, you know you you go and you take a look to see you know listen to what Paul said you know where our world is right now. And it's a bit of a mess, uh, but he's a he's a he's a class act. He's a great teacher, and I'm very proud to call him a friend. There you go. Yeah, he is a wonderful guy. Please. Give Eric my best when you see him today. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm ready to go over there around 2.30 this afternoon and uh, put a ball in the air with my two kids and a, and a friend of one of my kids. So it's the weather here in dreary old Pittsburgh is a little overcast, but it's going to be great. Good for you. I read an article about you, Bob, in the, in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette from a few years ago where you said regarding competition that once that fire gets in you, it's hard to get it out. Is it the desire to compete that drives you to continue to play on the on the PGA Tour or on the Champions Tour? Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, – I am very competitive. Um, I think that, you know, there's some people that would say maybe the opposite, but I, I believe I'm a pretty nice guy. Um, but I've got <laughs> – I'll second you know, that. The, yeah, I mean, well, there might be some people that, uh, you know, that might not agree with that, but I'm a pretty nice guy. But I can tell you um, – you know, I just I think whether I got it from my father or my mother. My mother's competitive as heck too, but um, I've always I've always loved to compete, and um, it's just the way that I'm wired. And so I'm very blessed. Again, as I said, my health is good. Uh, I'm in great shape. I went out and I worked. Oakmont's got a fitness center. Went over and I worked out this morning at about seven o'clock. 
And, um, you know, the owner of Greer Industries, which owns Pikewood National Golf Club, for five or six years, leading up into me turning 50 in last year, just said, you know, when you turn 50, you know, you've got to go do that. You've got a great game. You're talented. And so last year, he just said, okay, what do you need? I said, well, I said, really? I said, I needed about six months. They're not really competed in 10 years. I said, but if I have a month prior to campus tour qualifying, I'll get the job done. And so I went down to Florida, and I, I played and practiced at Jonathan's Landing Golf Club down there in Jupiter. And I played many tour events. I played three mini tour events every single week. And I'm competing against these 25-year-old kids that vomit. And, uh, you know, I won one of those. And But at the end of the day, I got to uh, Orlando for the first stage and, and shot 12 under par and finished second there. And then went to the finals and shot nine under par. Didn't get the job done. I finished 14th, which gave me the status that I have this year. But it's one of those things where once you compete, um, at least for me, I mean, I've always wanted to compete. I mean, I always... You know, you sit there and you do – your priorities change. You do certain things for your kids, do certain things for your family. And at the time that I stopped playing right. in 2003, I was not playing well. Um, I'd made a bunch of changes in my golf swing. I was playing more golf swing than I was golf. And so it, it was just one of those things. that wasn't playing well. I wasn't making money. Um, and I just like, you know what, I just, I just don't want to do this anymore, and it's time to move on. So I moved on after 2003, and I've been very blessed. Uh, that I was able to find a great job with, with Hillman Properties as an independent consultant. I worked on a couple of the golf course operations, bringing in clients to see and to sell memberships and, and, and real estate. And then in 2005, uh, just a happenstance uh, round of golf at Oakmont, I ran into the executive vice president of Greer Industries, and he offered me a job. And I handle not only Pikewood National Golf Club, but I'm also the vice president of marketing for the, our limestone, lime, and steel division. And I, as you said, I do a radio show. So um, I've been very blessed, and, you know, you sit there, and, and the Lord opens up a path for you, and you have to choose the right path. And for me, you know, I had a couple of different opportunities when I was done playing, but, you know, for something, just some told me that this Greer Industries is a great company, and so here I am, 50 years old, been with the company for 10 years, and the owner has presented me with this wonderful opportunity, which I'm going to have the opportunity again this year. I'm going to go down to Florida in October, I'm going to try to qualify for the, uh, the, the tournament and carry the tournament in, uh, in, at Rock Barn in Hickory, North Carolina, and then the one over in San Antonio, the AT&T. Hopefully getting one of those. You never know. You might win. I'm playing well right now. Uh, but if not, I'm going, to go and, uh, I'm going to go back to Champions Tour qualifying November 4th through the 7th and then November 17th through the 21st, and I'm planning on finishing the top five and uh, being fully exempt next year. There you go. We're rooting hard for you, too. Now, Thank you, Chris. You finished. You finished tied for low club professional at the Senior PGA Championship back in May, which is a great accomplishment. What did that mean to you? Well, first of all, the, the golf course, the golf club at Harbor Shores was magnificent. It was, uh, it was a, a, a total blast to play. Uh, for me, you know, I went out there trying to win the golf tournament. Now, is it realistic or so? Because when I, you know, I came back from Florida in April, and I'm doing my normal duties at Pikewood National Golf Club and, and the steel and the limestone and the lime. But, right. you know, I, I was playing well in there, and I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't finish well on uh, Sunday. I shot a couple over par on Sunday and, you know, wasn't happy with that. But, I ended up, as you said, I was low club professional there, a lot of great players at the club level. And, um, you know, it was, it was a big boost to me. Um, on top of that, you know, KitchenAid, Jeff Fettig, the CEO and chairman of KitchenAid Whirlpool, presented uh, Colin Montgomery, myself, and the other gentleman that I, I tied with, Craig Thomas. He presented all of us with the kitchen of our choice from KitchenAid. So I've, wow. got, this, I've got this. I, I you know, made ten, a little over $10,000 that week, finished 33rd in the tournament, low club professional. And, uh, you know, I've got a new kitchen whenever I need it or want right. it. So uh, it, was, it was great. You know, as, as Paul said, the game of golf, we really don't live in reality. Um, so many things are handed to you. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to be very gracious uh, in what you accept and how you treat people. And uh, I've always tried to live by that. And so, you know, the game of golf has presented me with a lot of opportunities. Um, and it, I'm just I'm, I'm very blessed to, uh, to have been part of the game and to play, play pretty well. And hopefully, uh, you know, I've got another 10 years ahead of me where I can compete and, and, and continue to play pretty well. There you go. You, you probably heard – uh, Paul and I talking about you know media and the media being everywhere and w how different it is now to you know really going all the way back to you know when, when your dad was playing baseball and the media coverage there. Rory McIlroy got you know a little heat this week for saying that Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson are aging a bit and dealing with injuries that have affected their games and we may not see Tiger dominate the game like he once did. 
I didn't find anything inflammatory in what Rory said. Did you? No, there's nothing inflammatory about it. It's it's fact. Uh, we're athletes. We make our living with our bodies. As your body ages, things happen to your body. Uh, Tiger right. Woods would be the first one to tell you that he is not as strong or as flexible as he was when he was 28. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. We're, we're, our society and the world in general has become so hypersensitive. Um, I don't do PC. And, and as you said, you've got to be careful. And Paul said you've got to be careful what you're saying because, you know, people are always looking. They always have a camera. They always have something rolling, this, that, and the other. They can always right. misconstrue what your intention was. But the fact that there was, there was absolutely nothing wrong with what he was. It was a statement of fact. Will Tiger Woods dominate such as he did? No, he's not going to. And there's, again, there's two reasons. Number one, actually, there's three reasons. Number one is body is not holding up. We all know that. Um, you know, he's had a lot of problems. He's got a very quick transition from the top of his golf swing down through impact, and that will take a toll. You know, especially just, just your left knee alone. At the moment of impact, your left knee alone takes two and a half times your body weight at impact into that knee. So you've got that, and then you've got the quick transition that he produces there. And so that's going to be very difficult for him. Number two, the players are no longer, they're no longer completely intimidated by him when he stands on the tee. It was like when Jack Nichols was at a golf tournament. When Jack Nichols was at a golf tournament, J.C. Sneed said it better than anybody else. And the same thing was true with Tiger Woods. He said, J.C. Sneed said, when you got to the tournament and Nichols is at the tournament, you knew he was going to beat you. He knew he was going to beat you, and he knew that you knew that he was going to beat you. And that's right. how Tiger Woods was for his entire career. You've got guys like Ernie Els, Davis Love, some of the best players we've seen in the last 25, 40 years. And they would get there, and Tiger would be on the tee, and they would wilt. They would wilt. Great players, uh, Hall of Fame careers. Tiger doesn't have that anymore. Okay, so the players aren't intimidated by him. And the other thing is what exactly what Roy said. He's getting older. He can't do the things that he used to do before. And so, what, you know, personally for me, I think that Tiger needs, I think he needs to stop screwing around with his golf swing. Um, right. Everybody is trying to get better. There's nothing wrong with that. That's natural. But you don't have to go in there and completely remake your golf swing. Jack Nicklaus never remade his golf swing. You know, he, got, right. he went to a period in the late 60s, early 70s, where he was not hitting it as well as he would like to. He got a little sloppy with his practice, and so he went back and he worked with Jack Rout on his fundamentals. And then 1980, so famous, famously, with Phil Rogers worked on his short game. And again, here he came out in 1979. They said he was done. 1980 comes and he won two major championships, the U.S. Open and the PGA. Right. So, but Jack Nicklaus never completely reinvented his golf swing, just Tiger Woods has. So, again, I just, it leaves me scratching my head. I know you want, he wants to get better, but to go there and to take the time where you're taking, you know, two steps back to go three steps forward, for me, with the amount of talent and what that guy had done um, you know, in the late 90s, early part of the 2000s, um, to go and redo what he, what he did didn't make any sense to me. Agreed. Bob, the, the Europeans are a uh, sizable favorite here in the next couple of weeks to win the, the, the Ryder Cup. In your mind, would it be a major upset if the U.S. won? It would be, it would be a catastrophic upset. Um, look, you've got uh, Dustin Johnson. We know, you know his problems are well documented. Right. You've got Jason Duffner, who's not available. Um, you know, the captain's picks. I like the captain's picks. I like Mahan. I like Webb Simpson. I like Keegan Bradley. You know, there's, there's some things going on now, you know, out there in the Twitterverse about, you know, gosh, you know, he should have waited. Maybe pick Billy Horschel. Maybe Chris you know, Chris Kirk or whatever he wants to do. The fact is right. he's, got a good, he's got a good squad assembled there. I just think the Europeans, the only thing that I tell you, the only thing that could possibly be to their detriment was that they, they possibly are overconfident. Um, but I just, I, just don't, I just don't see it. You know, we're, we're, we're over there, we're playing the Glen Eagles, we're playing on their home soil. Mickelson, you know, he, you know, he withdraws last week. He's not, he's not fresh. Now he's going to go home. He's going to relax, everything else. But he, again, Phil's 44 years old. And, you know, as Rory said, he's, he's older than he was. He doesn't hold a putt that he used to. He has not had a very good year. Um, you know, he you know, had a chance to win the PGA Championship there, this, that, and the other. But this is not the Phil Mickelson that we saw five or six years ago. So, again, you've got some guys that have got some Ryder Cup experience. You've got Jimmy Walker, who has no Ryder Cup experience. Again, I think the only thing, the only thing that is really going to open the door for the U.S. team and I'm an American. I bleed red, white, and blue. 
is going to be if the Europeans get overly confident, feel like they can just go out there, tee it up, and they're going to be handed the Ryder Cup. That's the only thing. That's the only way I think we can beat them. Tell our listeners about your show. The one on the you got one on the Back Nine Network, and you got a second one locally there in West Virginia. Talk about that and how our listeners can find and, and actually listen to you. Well, the the stuff that I do in the Back Nine Network really is I do some guest hosting for Matt Adams and Brian K occasionally. So that's something where you know I'll get an email from Brian or I'll get a phone call from Matt of those guys. Hey, listen, we're traveling. Are you going to be able to fill in? And because what we do. Uh, with Greer Industries, we also own 36 radio stations with 60 affiliates. So we actually have a big, big studio there with the, you know, the state-of-the-art equipment there in Morgantown. So when I do that, I will actually go down into our studio. We get linked up with New York, and it goes all across, you know, the United States. The show that I do on a regular basis is called T to Green, and that's on the West Virginia Radio Network. And we're on 36 stations throughout the state of West Virginia, and also Maryland. And our your listeners can listen to it. That's over now because we do it during the golf season. Because um, in West Virginia, this time of year, as you as you well know, Chris, this time of year, being from Pittsburgh, it's a foot. This is a football region, and people right. do foot. So we, we we discontinue the show in August, at the end of August, and we pick it back up in April. So the show runs from April to August, and it, we again, it's on 36 radio stations, but we also stream it on wvmetronews.com. Wvmetronews.com. We stream it every single every single Monday night. And it's just I've been with it's my same co-host now for 10 years, someone by the name of Fred Persinger, who's a, a true radio professional. We get on there and we get we get good guests. You know, we'll get Zinger on there, we'll get Arnold on there, we'll get Jack Nicholas on there, Davis Love, Jeff Sluman. Um, you know, we've had Mike Davis on numerous times. Tim Fincham's been on. So it's a really nice little. You know, it's, again, it's an hour long. It's on. It's on. It's from seven o'clock to eight o'clock Eastern time. You know, for for a little West Virginia radio show, it's actually we get some we get some pretty high powered guests. Yeah, I bet. I'm looking forward to checking it out, too. A couple more before we let you go, Bob. One, we talked last time about your, your new home course now, Pikewood National Golf Club, which is a private club up there in uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. Golf Digest named it one of America's 100 greatest golf courses. It was also voted best new course back in 2009. And from what I've seen on the video tour and what you've talked to me about in the past, it's it's absolutely one of the most beautiful golf courses on the planet. For those who weren't with us last time, talk about your golf course. Well, Pikewood National Golf Club, as you said, is in Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, we sit atop the Kingwood Pike. We're at an elevation of 2,300 feet. We designed the golf course ourselves. We basically were, were stone, steel, lime, and radio executives, but we all have very high golf IQs. The owner, John Racy, Bob Gwynn is the executive vice president. Those two guys were the primary architects. I sat in and uh, you know did some. Did you some did work the back nine, up. right? I was on the well. I did the second nine, which is the front nine. The back nine was already okay. completed, and then I I was on the design team for the front nine, which is the second nine that we built. And the golf course opened up uh, nine holes in 2003, and then all 18 holes opened up in 2008. And it is remarkable. On a clear day, you can see up to 60 air miles, but the fairways are flat. Um, it's kind of an old school style golf course where it's walking only. We don't own any golf carts. Uh, the owner, John Racy, is a firm believer in that uh, when you play the game of golf, number one, it's better enjoyed walking. And number two, he likes the idea that when you're playing golf, you should be getting exercise. So we're out there. there and it's, uh, it's private. It's walking only. We've got guest cottages on the facility. Um, I had a gentleman down who's a, a fellow Oakmont member who's also a raider for Golf Magazine. Uh, came down, he played our men's invitational July 11th and 12th this past year, and after the first round, he pulled me aside, and he said, friendly, i got to tell you something. He said, I have played 80 of the top 100 in the world. He said, I've never seen a golf course in better condition than this. And that's, wow. that includes Oakmont, Pine Valley, Augusta, and he said, anything you're doing in Japan or Korea, nothing can hold a candle to this. This is amazing. So our golf course superintendent, Brett Bentley, is, was the first assistant superintendent under John Zimmers at Oakmont for about 10 years. And Brett's been on board with us for about five, and he eats, sleeps, and barfs turf grass. That's all he does. <laughs> and he is, uh, he is an absolute rock star and very dedicated. And, and, you know, Greer Industries, John Racy, he gets, he gets the resources that he needs to produce a product that is exceptional. Wow. That's great stuff. Now, you guys got to be hosting a tour event here at some point, do you not? Well, no, you know what? Not really. Um, you know, we, we're more of a Pine Valley model than an Oakmont model. And the, and the owner's idea is that, you know what, we built this course 
for our members and their guests. And what we don't ever want to have happen is where a member calls in and says, hey, I need caddies tomorrow, uh, going to bring down two groups. And we say, oh, no, I'm sorry, we're closed. We've got XYZ Corporation as the golf course. Or, you know, we're hosting the, you know, the, uh, the XYZ Open. We're not, that's not going to happen here. It's a, it's a golf course that is for our members and their guests. We're open seven days a week. Uh, from April 1st until November 1, and, you know, it's just, again, it's a very private, very exclusive, walking only. It's it's kind of, uh, people have likened it to a man cave with grass. <laughs> and it, it is. We don't have any we don't have any women members, but women play. We have the wives of women that will come and play, and obviously women play as guests, this, that, and the other. We love women. We don't have any, we don't have any female guests as of yet, female members as of yet. Um, but it's primarily it's, it's it's built for men. I mean, it's a, it's a big brawny. You know, the forward tees played about 6,700 yards long. The back tees played about 7,500 yards long. Wow! And it's a little long, a little long for most women. But uh, the wives that come out of the members when they play, they'll either tee it up from all the way forward, or they might tee it up at the beginning of a fairway or whatnot. And they just love it because of the natural beauty of the no homes out there. All you really hear is the is the wind through the trees, the insects and the birds. And it is uh, it is really a truly remarkable place. Your listeners can go and take a look at it at, at pikewoodnational.com. And, um, again, it's a private club. If anybody has any interest in membership, there's a, there's a link there where uh, it will go directly to my email, and we'll address that and then get them in there to take a look at it. And if they, if they want to join, then we'll move it forward. Nice. Yeah, it's, it is magnificent. Congratulations on what that golf course has become. Um, yeah, we're, couple we're, more we're on, the, on the football. A couple more on the football side, Bob, before we let you go first. You played your college golf at LSU. Your Tigers are off to a 2-0 and start this season. You know, we had Paul on before you, who was a uh, big Alabama fan. But your boys, great win uh, you know, to start the season over uh, number 14, Wisconsin. You've got Ole Miss and Alabama back-to-back weeks in late October, early November. End the season on the road at Texas A&M, who isn't missing Johnny Manziel at all. How do you feel about your boys' chances to be, make the top four and get into this season's playoff? Well, look, I, I like their chances. They got a young team on the offense. The offense is relatively young. They, you know, they've got a couple of young quarterbacks there, a freshman and a sophomore. They're really untested. But, you know, again, again, the, the game, the game against Wisconsin, they looked terrible in the first half. I like to say that in the first half they looked like Vincent Price. The second half they looked like Nick Price. Um, <laughs> you know, John Chavis, our uh, our defensive coordinator, came from Tennessee. He's brilliant. LSU under Les Miles has historically been a second half team. I don't know what it is. They get in there, and, you know, he makes the call there against Wisconsin with the, with the fake punt, which is, you know, what the hat is notorious for. Um, but, look, LSU, they've got this young freshman uh, tailback, Fournette, Leonard Fournette from uh, New Orleans, 6'1", 230. I mean, this guy is – this guy is – he's got it all. So, um, look, they've got a great defense that came back from last year. Offense is young. You know, they lost their, they lost a couple of wide receivers, a couple of wide outs. So they've got some pretty young guys there on the offensive side. Les Miles, you know, for what everybody says about Les Miles, I mean, the guy, the guy gets the job done. I, I agree with what Paul said. And I think Nick Saban is the best coach in college golf. I know that's kind of sacrilege to say being an LSU guy. But, you know, as much as you, as much as you hate him at LSU, they can't, you cannot deny the fact that the guy is a great football coach. Um, that right. being said, uh, you know, we, we play this, you know, this week we play U- University of Louisiana Monroe. Um, they're in Baton Rouge tonight. And then we, then we start getting into it. We play Mississippi State the following week. The following week after that, we play Auburn away. So, you know, right. just like every single SEC school, the schedule is tough. Um, it's a black and blue conference. You know, the guys with a lot of hitting there, a lot of speed in the non-skilled positions. I like LSU's chances if the offense will gel. We ought to get, make sure we get to on a quarterback that we're able to get some of these wide receivers that are young guys with not a whole lot of experience, get them to mature a little bit faster than they possibly could, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, the, the team to beat, obviously, in the West is going to be Alabama. Always has been, always will be. So, speaking of looking like Vincent Price, Bob, our Steelers, terrible oh. showing oh. Thursday night. Up, is, are we in I, for a I long season? Up, yes. Yeah, I threw up in my mouth six times during the Ravens game. <laughs> um, they were, they're, you know what, it's years ago, uh, not years ago, actually two years ago, Mike Wagner, who's got four Super Bowl rings, number right. 23 for the Steelers in the 70s, absolute headhunter, wonderful guy, plays a lot of charity golf tournaments with him, wonderful, wonderful guy, loves the game of golf. And every year I see him the same charity event, and I, at the same time of year, I said, hey, Wags, what do you think? And he just looks at me just said, 
He said they're he said they're they're probably four years away from being real competitive again. And he said at that time he said Roethlisberger is going to be done. And he said they just they just don't have the horses that they had. He said they've gotten older. He said you know it takes you know two or three years for a young draft choice to really come up and to really mature into an NFL player. And he said by the time he said they just don't have the time, especially with Roethlisberger, because he's you know look at all the hits that he's taken over the years, this that and the other. Right. So. You know, look, I love my Steelers, I love my Pirates, and I love my Penguins, uh, but i got to be honest, I think the Steelers go – I'd be surprised if the Steelers go better than 8-8 eight and eight this year. I mean, that, right. you, know, you take a look at what happened in Baltimore. I mean, you've got a team with all this distraction with this this human debris, Ray Rice uh, issue, uh, you know, whacking his, right. whacking his fiance, hitting her with a left cry. Right. I mean, unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And they've got all the distraction with that, and they still go out there and they beat us 26-6. That's not. Right. That's not. That doesn't bode. That doesn't bode well for the black and gold this year. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm worried too. A third straight eight and eight season. You know. Uh, we we do a show on the football side, and you know many former Steelers on it. We got Rocky Blyer coming up next week. I'm interested to hear what Rock has to say. But we had Josh Miller on uh, a week ago, and uh, he said at this point he thinks that uh, even this is even before the Baltimore game. He thinks eight and eight's a stretch based on what he saw at training camp, which didn't make me feel very good either. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as a, the famous quote, although I will not say it, you can't make chicken soup out of chicken right. sleep. Right. So you know, if you don't if you don't have if you don't have the horses in the stable, you're not going to be able to compete at that level. Yeah, exactly right. All right, Bob. So how can our listeners follow you both online and over social media? Well, uh, online base, as I said, with the Western Union Radio Network is wbmetronews.com, and on social media, I am at. Bob Friend underscore golf on Twitter. And so uh, I'll be sending some stuff out here, getting ready for Champions Tour qualifying. <laughs> Excuse me, coming up the next month and uh, heading down to Florida here in October. So I'll be sending some stuff out there so people can follow me on that. Very good. Bob, thank you so much for coming back and joining me this morning. I tell you, I, and I said at the top of the show, and I mean this sincerely, you know, there was a time when uh, if I could have had to put, you know, if someone said, Chris, what's your dream for someone? What would you put together? I would have said Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, and my father, or Jack Nicholas, Gary Player, and my father. If they gave me the same opportunity to say who would be my dream for some today, I would say Paul, uh, Paul Stankowski, Bob Friend Jr., and my father. That, uh, that to me is a dream because you guys are such outstanding, not only uh, you know, outstanding guests, but outstanding individuals. And I can't thank you enough for coming back today. It's uh, always uh, a pleasure getting the opportunity to talk with you. Well, Chris, number one, I greatly appreciate the, that sentiment. That is an honor. Number two, I want to thank all of our men and women serving overseas, protecting my pink sorry behind in the United States of America. <laughs> they are, they are, there's a, that's a debt that we can never repay as a country. And I greatly right. appreciate coming on. You're wonderful, wonderful host, wonderful interviewer, always prepared. And I, I look, you talk to me anytime you wish. And hopefully, one of these days, we get an opportunity to play, Chris. Yeah, I'd love that, Bob. I hope that uh, I hope that opportunity comes as well. Thank you again for being here. Best of luck out there. You know, we're rooting hard for you. We're always behind you, and uh, it, you can't come back on the show soon enough. I hope that happens again real soon. Thank you so much, Chris. God bless. Same to you, Bob. All the best to you and your family. Thank you. Bob Friend Jr., what an absolute thrill today has been for me. Paul Stankowski, Bob Friend Jr., you're not going to find two better guys anywhere on the face of the planet, and uh, I can't thank them enough for uh, continuing to come back on the show with me. Um, Before we put a bow on this one, I want to let you know about a great new book that's out there. It's called A Golden 18, written by Roger Schiffman, and the photography is done by one of our friends and one of the greatest photographers anywhere on the planet, Jim Mandeville. Jim Mandeville, I'm sure you know, is the director of photography at the Nicholas Companies. The book showcases some of Mr. Nicholas's greatest course designs. The stories are great. The photography, the photography is outstanding. I'm telling you, you know, looking at the pictures that Jim has got in there, those are ones that you wish you could just pull right out of there, put in a frame, and put on your wall. They're that outstanding. Um, you know, it's just eye-popping, everything about it. You're going to love this book. Uh, please be on the lookout for it. Again, it is called A Golden 18. Uh, fantastic stuff. All right, everybody, it's uh, time for us to put a, uh, a bow on this one. 
Uh, my sincere thanks again to Paul, uh, Paul Stankowski and Bob Fred Jr. for being wonderful guests with me this morning, and I thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you the very most. Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari and our announcer, Joe Lajanusa. That show airs uh, every Thursday night from uh, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We're joined every week by legends from around the NFL and the CFL. Uh, please also check out both shows on Facebook and give us a like. That's important to us, too, so you can find us online. This show is next on the T.net and ThursdayNightTailgate.com. You can stream or download any of our archived episodes and keep up to date with any of our uh, who our future guests are going to be on either show. Thursday Night Tailgate uh, celebrates its third anniversary next Thursday night. So we are excited. we got five of our, uh, our great guests that have been with us over the years uh, joining us, as you heard me allude to, Rocky Blyer being one of those. But thanks again uh, for choosing to listen to this show this morning. We appreciate it. And until next week, hit them straight, my friends.